Well, good morning, Satellite Beach United Methodist Church. How are we doing today? Hey, we're all here, aren't we? Well, let's all stand up. And it looks like Talison is going to lead us in our call to worship this morning. <laughs> look at that look. Isn't that precious? Amen. Well, let's join together in our call to worship. Oh, wait, she's right here. She's right here. She's right here. Oh, oh, she's she's right. Right. Never mind. I was just kidding. There's the star. It's wonderful. All right, let's join together in our call to worship. The Lord has brought us from bondage. And redeemed us from the house of slavery. Therefore, let us praise the name of the Lord. That all the world may know how God has saved us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And you may be seated and welcome on this wonderful Sunday morning. 
It's a communion Sunday, so if you didn't get your communion cup when you came in, just raise your hand and somebody will bring it to you as we're doing the announcements. If you could also sign the attendance pads and pass them down, that would be great too. Thank you for doing that. Our prayer focus this week is for our kids that are in preschool. Um, We have a wonderful preschool and we want to pray for those that are going to our preschool that they kind of grow and wonderful, have good times while they're here. And also related to our preschool, I've got a request. Um, He's actually, I baptized this little boy a few years back, uh, Lincoln Appling. Um, At the end of last year, he got one of those respiratory things that put him in the hospital for quite some time uh, that you've heard going around with the kids. He's still at home. His mom has not been able to go back to work. She works in our preschool because she's forced to stay home with them. And that has hit them very financially very hard for the extended hospital stay and not being able to go back to work because she has to be home with her child and not be around other people to possibly bring something home. And it's just one of those tragic things that has happened. He's getting better, but it's a slow process. And so what I want to ask you all is if you can help in any way, um, you can go to our app, you can give a check and to just donate to help that family out because they're a wonderful family. They're part of our church. They're part of our preschool. Um, So if you see that in your heart, please just put it in there and you can just put Appling, A-P-P-L-I-N-G on your check. Uh, There should be a place on the, uh, if you go to the app, I think we have uh, some. Yeah, there's a block you can write on it. So thank you for doing that. Uh, Tomorrow morning we'll be praying. We meet over there at 8.30 in the morning. If you'd like to come join us, please do that. We have an ice cream social and bunko for all. It's going to be right after the second service at 12.30 today. So you can go get some to eat and come back, get some ice cream and play some bunko at 12.30 in the COC, I believe. Uh, Next Sunday is our marriage covenant renewal. Uh, Today's the last day to let us know if you'd like to participate in it so we can get the um, bouquets for the brides ready. So just let me know if you would like to participate in that. Also next Sunday is our churl... Church World Service Blanket Sunday. We'll be taking up an offering. Please do not bring in blankets. Every year somebody brings in a blanket. We are sending money because they can buy blankets absolutely cheaper than you could ever go out and find. Uh, There's a company they work with that makes them, and so your cash goes a lot further away than spending the money on a blanket and bringing it. Also, our pictorial directory, we're still trying to get everybody signed up for that. Um, So far, we have about 134 people are signed up. We average about 200, so that means one-third of the people who attend here regularly do not want to have their picture taken. I'm not sure why, (laughs) but that's been the case everywhere I've been, even the pictorial direct recognized. But we want to get you in there so other people can find you, look at you, and greet you. So uh, please sign up. We've got some dates still on Saturday the 25th, and right after church, you can sign up for that. Our Ash Wednesday service is going to be on the 22nd of this month at 6 p.m. And we'll be starting in March 1st, our Wednesday night renewal program. We're going to have a dinner and then Bible studies after that. Um, So you can sign up back there. And one of the Bible studies has already got a sign-up sheet. Um, Kyle's going to be teaching something, so she's got a sign-up sheet and what she's teaching on there. And your giving statements, you should have already received your giving statement in the mail or an email. If you didn't, it's because we assume you'll be here this Sunday. And so we have a handful of them back there to try and save us the postage. So if you would please, if you didn't get one yet, either in the mail or by email, please go check. It's on the counter behind the sound booth. And that buzz is irritating, but I don't know what it's coming from. (laughs) So at this time, let us stand and wave and greet one another.
stand in line with you each and every day, but we're so grateful that you come and seek out that one who's fallen behind, who's seen a different light, who chases other things that are not of you, but you come and stand before us, you got us back to the group. Father God, we ask that you just give us that heart, that servant's heart to seek those out, to seek the one that may be chasing the wrong things, to seek that one who's lost you because of hurt, that has lost you because of anger. Let us just stand before them with open heart, open ears, Lord, to hear them. Maybe not to speak the words that you've given us, Lord, but just to lend an ear. Let us slowly plant those seeds to, to turn their hearts back to you. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with song. Of deliverance 
from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Cause I'm no seated and before we pray just a quick little update um, Catherine had her surgery on the first uh, to remove the tumor from her brain she surprised me and called me on the second blew away her dad called her dad I talked to her dad and he says I can't believe it she was in no pain feeling great and they got her up and so now it's just the kind of wait and see kind of thing, monitoring. So she just really appreciated the prayers we gave her that Sunday before we sent her off. She knows that she is resting in God's goodness and God's greatness. 
and she wanted me to share that with you. And the other thing is the rose on the altar, uh, Ruth Singletary's sister passed away this last week. It's kind of hit her pretty hard because she's sick and then this happened and just a lot of stuff going on. So keep Ruth in your prayers, the family in your prayers on the death of her sister. So let us go to Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we come here this morning resting in your goodness, your greatness, your power, your love, your love for us. It's amazing that you love us. As ornery and stubborn as we are, as we go our own way so often and ignore the blessings of, his, of you, you still love us. And we thank you that you never stop loving us, never stop chasing us, never stop calling us. We thank you that you're that kind of God. And this morning, Lord, we lift up Catherine to you and we praise you that she got through the surgery. And Lord, just heal her completely now. Restore her to the love she has for you and her family and her church and her mission and her passion. Lord, she's touching so many lives, even in the hospital where she's the patient, she's touching others, sharing your love with them. So just continue to bless her. And Lord, we lift up Ruth Singletary and the family there. They've said goodbye to a loved one and it's hard. Even though we know they're with you, it's hard to say goodbye for a while, to not hug, to not get on the phone and talk. So bless them, Lord, in this time. And Lord, we not only lift up these two, but we lift up all of those that are on our prayer list. You know their needs, Lord. Bless them as only you can. Heal them, restore them. And we even now, Lord, lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, we do lift up our preschool and all the students that attend there. They're at the beginning of life, Lord, full of love and laughter and energy. And Lord, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to help them grow, to discover who you created them to be, the gifts you've given them and the talents you've given them. So bless these students as they come here. Bless them as they grow and become the men and women you've created them to be. And bless those who work in our preschool. Give them patience and understanding and wisdom as they guide these young minds. And Lord, we lift up our church to you and ask that you continue to show us how we might reach out and touch those in this community. Help us to be your church Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to love as you have loved. Because we want to be your church. We want to be your people and walk in your ways. And we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we also lift up Lincoln Appling to you and ask that you continue to heal him and restore him to bless him, to heal him. We thank you, Lord, that you are a healer. And we now close in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, we invite our children to head off to Children's Church as they head through the double doors over there, and they'll be at the back, and they'll return at the end of the, first, at the, end of the service.
Sorry, I just got a message from my wife. We just had another test done on Bailey. Still undetectable disease, y'all. It's a praying church. Y'all are awesome. We thank you so much. God is awesome with his miracles. It's just amazing what he can do. We're so thankful for those miracles. Let's all stand up together, and we're going to join together in song one more time. Mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. come to that time where we lift up our tithes and offerings and we finally got a summary of all our expenses and resources and things we did last year. Shirley spent a whole month of January getting all this stuff ready for our year-end reports because the Methodists make you report a lot of stuff. But we gave away not counting apportionments I'll add that in a second but we gave away close to $72,500 last year to help other people. That's counting the tornadoes, the hurricanes, the Ukraine relief, and flood buckets. It's counting our support of our church in Cuba, our support of our Boy Scout troop here, the, the different ministries in Brevard County, the football dinners, our scholarship, helping families that are in need. And this does $72,000 does not include 
our Thanksgiving baskets. It doesn't flow through our checkbook. The angel tree gifts. The Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. And when you add that we gave probably, our, our portraits are about 48,000, I can't, close to 50,000. And their portraits go to help our colleges. They help students who are going to seminary. They help his, um, our black colleges, our Methodist black college. We have 113, I think, colleges and 13 seminaries. Our part of our portrait supports that. Plus they support the, the operation of the staff. They support new church starts. So y'all have been a blessing. And I've been saying this for about six months now and I'm gonna be talking more and more about it. This community needs this church. Of any other church that I've been in in my whole life, this church interacts with its community more than any other church I've been a part of. And if this church were to go away, this community would lose something powerful. So thank you for touching people's lives, for being Christ to those that are hurting, to be his hands and feet. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Well, God of grace and peace, we thank you that you are a good God and that you bless us and bless us and bless us. And Lord, we thank you that you tell us not to hold on to these blessings, but let them flow through us to others. You call us to be rivers of grace, that as grace is poured into us, it is poured out through us, so the more can be poured in through us and out through us. So Lord, continue to to help us help others. And Lord, now as we give these our tithes and offerings, as we present them to you, multiply them as you have in the past. Bless them and guide us in their use. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning of the 18th verse. Hear now these words. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling blocks to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters, Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I've always amazed at what people actually believe. I'm sure many of you have heard the tale that according to aerodynamics, a bumblebee should not be able to fly because its wings are too small. That's one of the greatest lies out there. 
It's not a true statement. Aerodynamics does show how a bumblebee can fly. Just not if you apply the aerodynamics to a fixed wing plane. No, it will not. Bumblebees don't have fixed wings. This weekend, I read a survey about children in Britain about what they believe, and they found that 40% did not know that bacon, eggs, and milk came from an animal. But then there was also a percentage of those that believed a cherry Coke or an orange soda counted as a serving of fruit. I was one of those as once. And nearly 20% of the people in the UK believe that slight savers, those that used in Star Wars, actually exist. And of course, nearly 20% of the people in America have no idea what we are celebrating on July 4th. And 2% believe we gained our independence from France. And then there's the Titanic. In 2012, that was the 100th anniversary of the Titanic sinking. When the news came out, many young people in the UK were confused because they did not believe that the Titanic was a real ship. They just thought it was a movie. But then the flip side is there's a bunch of people who believe in the movie Jack and Rose are real characters based on real lives. They're not. Many of the people in the movie they interact with are based on real characters, but Jack and Rose were made up. We believe in many things. And for some, even showing them proof they are all wrong won't change their mind. Psychologists have shown that in people, once we've decided, we don't like to redecide. They have found that the brain has to consume extra energy in the process of changing or rearranging our beliefs. And that simple neurological laziness, that tendency to conserve glucose and oxygen, as they said, predisposes the brain to keep the configurations it already has. Hence, we believe what we already believe. That's part of who we are. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, talks about what people demand as proof to believe in something. And for many people, if you want to be honest about it, the Bible doesn't always make sense. It's not sometimes the greatest thing to read at, because if you read at it, it teaches us to do things that go against our very nature. I think that is why one person believes it and the next person rejects it. Think about it. The Bible teaches us to love those who hate us and curse us. The Bible teaches you to give up a part of your day to come and worship God. The Bible teaches you to give your money away. The Bible teaches you to give your time away. The Bible teaches you to forgive those who wrong you. The Bible teaches you to die to yourself so that others might live. The Bible teaches you to take up your cross. If you look at it, that's a bunch of foolishness to the world standards. It doesn't make sense. And Paul says the cross is a stumbling block to so many. Paul says it's foolishness. But he says God loves foolish things, and I am glad he loves foolish things. That enables me to get up here and talk. But God loves the foolish things, the weak things, and the things that, and people that nobody wants. The people that the world rejects, God loves and God uses. And for many people, there's even a debate, did Jesus actually exist? And one of the things they point to is there is no definitive physical or archeological evidence that Jesus ever existed. I love what one researcher said of this. He said, no, there's nothing conclusive, nor would I expect there to be. Peasants normally don't leave an archeological trail. The University of North Carolina Religious Studies professor, Bart Ehrman, he authored a book, Did Jesus Exist? The Historical Argument for Jesus of Nazareth said this of the argument. He said, the reality is that we don't have archeological records for virtually anyone who lived in Jesus' time and place. The lack of evidence does not mean a person at the time didn't exist. It means that he or she, like 99.9999% of the people of the world, don't impact the archeological record. 200 years from now, will there be an archaeological record that you existed? Probably not. There won't be a statue somewhere with your name on it, something to dig up with your name on it. 
Archaeology isn't a good place for understanding if a a certain person existed. But it does help us if events happened, if places existed. An interesting point, when I was in seminary, we read several things about archaeologists who were going out to prove the Bible wrong. And time and time again, these archaeologists set out to prove the Bible wrong only to prove the places did exist that the Bible talked about. And even after they saw their own evidence, they still couldn't believe it. That's the way we are. But we do find reference of Christ in the written record. Historian Flavius Josephus wrote one of the earliest non-biblical accounts of Jesus. Joseph, Flavius Josephus was a probably, as Ehrman says, is the far and away best source of information about first century Palestine. And twice he mentions Jesus in Jewish antiquities, his massive 20-volume history of the Jewish people that was written about 93 AD. He was born a few years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, around 37 AD. And he was a well-connected aristocrat and military leader in Palestine. He served as a commander in Galilee during the first Jewish revolt against Rome between 66 and 70 AD. And Dr. Lawrence, I'm going to butcher his name, Mykutiuk, who has a PhD in Hebrew and Semitic studies, noted that although Josephus was not a follower of Jesus, he was around when the early church was getting started, so he knew people who had seen and heard Jesus. And he actually refers to Jesus not directly, but in an indirect way. He was actually talking about Jesus' brothers James and how the high priest had put James to death unlawfully and he called James, who was the, had a brother named Jesus, who they called the Messiah. Another account of Jesus appears in the annals of Imperial Rome, a first century history of the Roman Empire written around 116 AD by the Roman senator and historian Tacitus. In chronicling the burning of Rome in 64 AD, Tacitus mentions that Emperor Nero falsely blamed the persons commonly called Christians who were hated for their enormities. And he writes that Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. And there were other Romans that mentioned Christ and his followers. Roman governor Pliny the Younger, who wrote to Emperor and Trajan about the subject. And Roman historian Suetonius references Jesus in noting that Emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews from Rome, who were making constant disturbances at the instigation of Christus. Dr. Ehrman says that this collection of snippets from non-Christian sources may not give us much information about who Jesus was, but they're useful for realizing that Jesus was known by historians who had reasons to look into the matter. No one thought he was made up. But today, a recent survey discovered that 40% of adults in England did not believe that Jesus was even a real historical figure. I believe that this is a sign that we don't even want to research what we believe anymore. Paul, at least, the Greeks said, look for wisdom. But today, we simply look for what is said by our favorite celebrity or politician or what is trending on social media, and that's what we'll believe. We're not going to invest anything into it. And while those today who believe that Jesus never existed, most scholars cannot find an ancient historian who said that. Many are quiet on the subject because in the first 50 years after Christ's death, the number of followers was not enough to make the news. But those who dealt with the Palestine area talked about him. So in reality, there's enough evidence to prove that Jesus did live and die. The debate about Christ is whether did he die and live. Is Jesus the Son of God? And part of answering that comes down to faith. And it's not a blind faith. It's a lived faith. I like the way someone wrote this. It was a pastor who put it this way. For all the appearance, for all that appears obvious to one who has lived with these truths, the Bible sounds outrageously out of touch with the world that is to those who read it only casually or curiously. A few things might strike even such people as being basically true, but the, be- but the deep internal truths of the scripture are not the sort of things one dreams up in laboratories or proves with mathematical logarithms. The truth of scripture is experienced in living it or is seen as non-essential nonsense or it is seen as 
essential nonsense. There is no explaining what is found here, only a believing of what one reads. And that's what it comes down to. What are we going to believe? What are we going to live out? And over the years, I have probably been more naive than most people. Naive in the fact that I trust people and I try to look for the good in people. And I found that I've gotten more successes than being burned over life by being naive about people. But what I've learned just watching people is they tend to find only what they are looking for and ignore the rest. We have that propensity that we will only find what we are looking for and we ignore all other evidence to the contrary. We're kind of like this story about John H. Holliday. He was the founder and editor of the Indianapolis News. One day he stormed right out of his office in search of the person who spelled height as H-I-G-H-T. He was going to tell that person what they could do. Well, a per worker checked the original copy and explained that Holiday himself was the one who spelled it without the E. And his response was, well, if that's the way I spelled it, that has to be right. And it said the paper misspelled the word height for the next 30 years in its newspaper. Some people will not change their mind or admit that they believe something wrong. But for Paul, the basic thing of understanding God's truth is all about understanding that God loves us. It is understanding that the cross is the ultimate symbol of love. It is understanding that God looks at what this world rejects and said there is value there. There's value in that person. Maya Angelou's book, Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now, she tells of a lesson she learned many years ago from her voice teacher, Frederick Wilkerson. Wilkerson asked Angelou to read a passage from the book, Lessons in Truth. The passage ended with this simple line, God loves me. Each time Maya read it through in just the manner she thought Wilkerson wanted, but each time he insisted she read it again. Finally, on the seventh reading through, Maya Angelou began to cry. She realized the truth of what she was reading. She writes, I knew that if God loved me, then I could do wonderful things. I could try great things, learn anything, achieve anything. Because that's what God frees us. This is the power of our faith and the truth of God. But we battle a problem that we have made God a feeling. A feeling that can be whatever we want it to be, that we are more and more making God into our own image. In an article in Christianity Today a few years back, writer Tim Stafford told about a pastor friend of his, Stephen Belinsky, who starts off each confirmation class. He, he has a jar full of beans and he asks all the confirmads to guess how many beans are in the jar. And he writes down the, on a, a board there, their names and their answers. And then the next column, he writes down, he asks each one, what is your favorite song? And he writes those down. And after he writes those down, he, he tells all the kids how many beans were in the jar. And they look at the answers to see who was the closest to the number of beans in the jar. And then he asks this question, Okay, who was the closest person to what the best, the most favorite song is? Of course, all the students say, well, there is no right answer. Each one has their own favorite song. And he follows that up and he says, okay, is choosing one's faith more like guessing the number of beans in the jars or choosing a favorite song? And he says, he's asked this question over and over to young and old. And he gets the same answer over and over. That choosing one's faith is more like choosing a favorite song. Stafford, when he was interviewed, says, what do you say to that? Do you confirm them after that? He said, Belinsky says, well, I first try to argue him out of that thought. 
Because with God, we are searching for the truth. Because there is a truth out there. But we want to make it a feeling. And it's not a feeling. Feelings are involved. Experience is involved. But there is a truth out there to be determined, to be found. We can't prove it. The resurrection happened by any scientific means today. We must rely on other things. Just as the courts rely on other things when there is no eyewitness that says, I saw him shoot so-and-so. Yet there is evidence out there to prove that happened. And that's the way our faith is. There is evidence out there to point us in the right direction. Paul says that Jews demand a miracle before they'll believe. Greeks want something that sounds wise. But God gives us something different. He gives us a changed life. He gives us his word of those who were there. He gives us experiences and even reason. We, in the Wesleyan tradition, we see this truth by starting with scripture. We then look at that scripture through the lenses of tradition, reason, and experience. And this is most often done by living it. In fact, the way we understand anything we believe is we live it. And in living it, we find the truth or not. And unfortunately, today, we're living in a horrible experiment. Is God alive or not? And our country's going to try and live. No, there is no God. And we see a lot of pain and suffering and anger and hurt and suicide. William Woodfin once noted that the proof of Christianity is not a book but a life. The power of Christianity is not a creed but a Christian character. And wherever you see life that has been transformed by the grace of God, you see a witness to the resurrection of Christ. Elton Trubot added that our faith is not belief without proof but trust without reservation. I believe in this life, more often than not, we find what we seek for. A lot of us here today are seeking God in Christ. Some are still questioning. But to know God is to seek him. And one of the greatest things I've found in, Christ, in Scripture is God says, question me, ask me. I'm not afraid of doubt. I'm not afraid of questions. I'm not afraid to be asked. The question is, are we afraid to ask? Are we afraid what God might reveal about us and him? Seek him and see if he does not make a difference in your life. Let us pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your power and your grace and your peace. And Lord, we thank you that you reveal ourself, yourself to us over the years as we live it. So, Lord, help us to see, open our minds. Give us the courage to ask the tough questions about you, knowing you will reveal yourself to us. So, Lord, reveal yourself to each one here. Show them your power in their life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And one of the ways that we remember Christ is through his life, his death, his teaching which he asked us to remember in the act of Holy Communion. So at this time, take out your cup and pour off the little cellophane top. And I will instruct you when to take the wafer and the juice. And so we come to remember Jesus Christ, how he lived, how he gave himself up for us on the cross, and how he returned and inspired his disciples to go into all the world to share his love. So let us pray. O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to your table, we're thankful that you are our God, that you feed us, that you give us power and strength for each day. You give us a hope for the future. But Lord, we know we don't deserve to come to this table because we've done some things we shouldn't have done or didn't do the things you wanted us to do. 
but to let each person here know that in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And so, Lord, as we come to this, your table, make this bread and this juice be for us the body and blood of Christ. Make us one with each other and one with you in ministry to the world until we feast together that heavenly banquet. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. So this time, take the wafer, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Once again, Lord, we're thankful for your love, your power in our lives, the hope you give us. We thank you for your everlasting presence, that we cannot escape your love. You were there before we get there, and you were there behind us, pushing us. We thank you for that. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. Just a quick reminder, of the, we have the, you can sign up for a directory back there. We also have the sign-up sheet for the Wednesday night dinners coming up. And so let us reach up and grab God's hand and go knowing that he will walk with you, that he will guide you and lead you. He will love you and free you and empower you to do great things. So go in his power. Go in his love and change the world. Amen.